I'm interested in perception and how we see things, how we see the world. So it has less to do with process in terms of craft. Um, that's something, you know, one learns in one's 20s. In a way, as you get older as an artist, you unlearn it. So the, I use the relevant medium to the relevant idea. Essentially, I'm an artist who makes mostly paintings and drawings. I've used oil paint, I use water-based medium, but it all has to do with fluidity, light and perception. I think by saying the same thing again and again, it's almost like when you repeat a word, the, the, the. Or you say a prayer, depending on who you are and how you pray, what it is you say, whether it's Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, Christian. It takes on a different meaning each time you say it. It's not my desire to impress people with the little things that one doesn't necessarily look at. And my work is not about the everyday. It's not, you know, look at the glass. Have you ever looked at a glass before? It's about something that I might see for a moment, you know, and somehow I feel compelled to show that moment. I have to be very careful when I work in terms of how I use a scale, and the work isn't complete unless a viewer is standing in front of it. So although it might be a minimal piece of knitting or a bottle of medicine, it needs you to interact, you the viewer. So I think of my work as interactive, rather than a picture. I actually am very open to interpretation, how other people receive the work, and I get a lot from working with curators and gallerists and so forth. So I'm very happy with conversation for particular um, series to be broken up and interdispersed, because then it becomes a collaborative thing. In terms of inventory, things have to be numbered and put in a certain format. Of course, my ultimate dream is to have a museum with hundreds of glasses, you know, another room with the big knitting paintings and so forth. On the other hand, I'm really excited to break up the series and interdisperse them because during different spans of my lifetime, different things work together. You know, you've got crystal balls and upside down glasses and you've got the large knitting and the blood knitting or the long red knitting. It was when I lived in Minneapolis that I began painting many jars, many objects, in a very different way, and thinking about sequence. In a way, my first influence, um, if I'm to be clear here, was my bridge, and looking at zoetropes as well, thinking about repetition in that way. What happened when I moved to Long Island is I started listening to Bach. I started thinking about the space between notes, that was a huge influence. I listened to the fugues again and again and again and again. That was about the summer of 1991. And I think that, in a way, was a profound influence and in thinking more clearly about reflection and refraction. And it was a painting I made called Stirring Spoons, which was 14 feet wide. So I guess I took an, an initial glass and then I expanded it. I became interested in peripheral vision rather than vision. So for me, my interest was never about a picture. It was about having a viewer um, interact with the work. So I suppose the first painting wasn't that minimal. It was about repetition, but it was about sequential movement. I had eight glasses that were a little like an octave. Um, and I was thinking a lot about music rather than, and sound, rather than painting or a story. This is how I've been working with the paintings, I take the lid off and I have, to, I try to change the light so it's not too bright. Throughout the Old Testament there are references to light, to honey and to milk, which I think are particularly nourishing items or subjects. I think when you leave your country, the more nostalgic you can get, you know, that you kind of remember the good stuff and I would take things from the grocery stores that became hugely precious to me and bring them back to New York. And I would get clear honey. I think that's being clear as a person. Set honey, and I think that's for someone who's set in their ways, who's not clear. And I would bring them to New York and paint them. I would get milk of magnesia, Boots cough medicine, Lydia Pinkham, all these things that are in my work from the healing series. 
and grocery store items and cleaning things. You know, I would bring things back to New York and they would be precious and I would make giant paintings of them. They were made with love, but somehow they weren't in a way present. I was present making them, but they were about nostalgia in a funny way. They were about missing something. And of course, when I came back to England, I was like, oh my God, I'm in the place that I was talking about. Now what do I do? I think that's where the flies came in or looking at raindrops on the window, things that perhaps in a way transformed the work. Being present with the work, in front of the work, and I had to consciously tell myself, apart from a few nostalgic works about New York, I'm here, right now, and this is what I'm making the work about. For me, it's been very important to get to know writers and to have a a proper relationship about the work. It's generally happened organically. Um, I've always been interested in talking to people from various backgrounds because I feel that I, having that dialogue, whether a writer's from a poetry background or a literature background or a not history background, somehow um, it helps me make the work. You know, it helps in, it's a form of collaboration. I feel in this day of Facebook, the idea of showing what you've done and getting a like, um, I'm, Obviously, occasionally I'll show part of a foot or a bit of paint on the floor, but I'm much more interested in a proper critical dialogue and I found um, I've had that and I've been grateful for that. Probably because as you get older, you, you desire that more, or at least I do. Um, and perhaps now I've got more to say than when I was in my 20s. I think, you know, for me as an artist, I don't particularly want to just show and tell, but I need to kind of have other people on board with me having a dialogue and a conversation. It's been phenomenal doing the DAX 360 thing because I love organising and being kind of organised and I find that when my head is clear, I can work better. I feel excited. I feel I can kind of look back on various strands of the work and come across things I'd forgotten about. I've put everything into themes, you know, on a website that I'm building specifically through DAX. Um, it's marvellous because I get to see my work afresh. So I've been able to hire people in Manhattan in my storage space there to go through the work that's literally been there since 9-11 um, and label everything because before it was a chaotic mess. So now I have a systemized inventory and every work has a number, a label. Um, it's fantastic. I do believe that we still need things that are actually made made with paint, made with pencil. And in terms of being present with materials, um, there's a materiality to my work. I suppose in a way it's quite old fashioned as, as one might say, but at the same time, I hope it's contemporary. I think each body of work probably has a different legacy, whether it's knitting, whether it's medicine, whether it's photograms or paintings of crystal balls, whether they are healing remedies. I think my work kind of weaves in and out of time. So in a way, my own work takes from the Fayum portraits, it takes from everyday activity, it takes from politics, it takes from life in general. And perhaps what my work does best is reflect our time.